welcome to you and to everyone here today. Uh, Dr. Cook is the State Secretary for Financial Market Policy and European Policy at the German Federal Ministry of Finance. We've had the four W's here in Ireland in recent days. Uh, today, the Minister's speech has four T's, timely, targeted, temporary, and transformational. The German strategy for recovery in the EU, the title of his talk today. At a time when Germany holds the EU Council presidency, his remarks will be particularly interesting as we face into an autumn of great uncertainty. A brief note on Jörg's background. He has held his current role since 2018. Prior to his appointment as State Secretary, he had a distinguished career in the private sector, working with Goldman Sachs in a variety of senior roles. He holds a PhD in finance from the University of Chicago, a master's in public administration from the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard, and a master's in economics from the Pantheon Sorbonne University in Paris. Uh, both his initial address and the Q&A session will be on the record. You can submit your questions and comments by, via the Q&A function on Zoom, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen. And we would ask you to identify both yourself and your affiliation in the written question. That would be most helpful. And also, please feel free to tweet to your heart's content at the handle hashtag IIEA. And with that, um, could I hand over to Dr. Cookies? Yes, hello, and uh, apologies that, uh, that this uh, <clears throat> doesn't work better and that I have to uh, do this on phone instead of video, but uh, um, I think we're trying in parallel to, uh, to join by uh, Zoom, so uh, maybe during the presentation I'll be able to get in. Um, anyways, um, I, I think we, um, we, are, um, we got off to a quite, uh, quite uh, quick start. Um, in, the, um, in the presidency and, uh, and are trying to, um, <clears throat> to, uh, to um, extend that, uh, that quick start. We, uh, we obviously in July had a um, big um, moment with the uh, recovery fund and uh, we worked uh, quite intensively over the summer to um, implement the recovery fund and the own resources decision, the MFF, and uh, to, to make sure that um, that with uh, with all of the in these instruments, we um, we participate in the recovery of the European Union and uh, make sure that uh, that uh, that uh, Europe embarks on a recovery path. We've had very constructive discussions and um, are um, are on a good path, I would say, um, to um, to um, discussing with the member states, the European Parliament, the Commission, and everyone involved a path that will allow us to. Make um, basically implement the um, the summit conclusions um, of the 750 billion facility into um, into practical legislative work um, over the course of the next month, so that hopefully early in the year um, the first funds will start flowing. And um, and in that sense, I think um, I think that would be um, that would be very uh, positive and a good signal to uh, to markets and to um, and to um, to the European Community. Um, that is something that uh, that we're trying to work on at the moment. Um, I just joined by video. Is that am I visible now on video? Yes, you are, Dr. Cookies. Ah, perfect. Okay. Okay. Um, um, the, so, in essence, the the first priority, obviously, for the next few uh, months during our presidency, will be to implement. The RRF, the own resources decision, the MFF, um, and um, and all of the legislative work that is connected to it. Um, apart from that, um, we have three big pillars of priority um, pertaining to capital markets union, banking union, and the digital union. Under the capital markets union, um, I think uh, we've seen um, some very good um, progress. We got uh, we got um, um, a report from the. Next CMU group last year, which was commissioned by the finance ministers of Germany, France, and the Netherlands, um, we just received the um, the high-level forum um, report um, with 120 pages of very insightful ideas, very practical ideas um, that uh, that uh, go into um, a lot of detail how to improve the European capital markets in terms of financial reporting, market making, um, issuance of equity. 
um, deepening markets uh, for European securities um, and uh, and going into um, a lot of uh, a lot of these areas that uh, that are important for <clears throat> the functioning of our markets and um, of course a lot into custody and settlement uh, post trade. So in that sense, um, it's really a very good um, and well balanced package. Um, we see the um, the ideas and the process <clears throat> on a deepening of the. Um, uh, anti-money laundering rules um, as also extremely important both for capital markets and banking union um, and uh, we are strongly in favor of um, moving from a directive um, to a um, uniform regulation on AML because we have seen in many cases that the um, that the lack of uniformity in application of AML rules um, is quite uh, quite negative and has uh, adverse impact on the stringency with which we can Im impose AML rules. We are also in favor and will continue to work um, on setting up a um, supervisory authority on AML that uh, will work across uh, the EU. So I think that's also an important aspect. Um, and a further um, important um, project both for CMU and Banking Union is, of course, sustainable finance. I think um, it's a hugely important, um, um, and since a few, um, since uh, since the last um, few months, becoming mu much more of a mainstream topic um, of sustainable finance and the ESG. So we will continue to work on the taxonomy to make sure that Europe is the world leader in presenting a framework for uh, for green and sustainable investing. I think that can be a very Big competitive advantage that Europe can have. So in that sense, um, we're very optimistic that um, both the CMU directly and a lot of the projects that will indirectly strengthen CMU will make uh, will make progress in the next few months under our presidency. Um, on banking union, um, the ECOFIN had a very good discussion. Um, and the Eurogroup had a very good discussion. Apologies um, on uh, Friday in Berlin, and uh, we are keen to revive the debate that has um, stalled a little bit over the last few months due to the priority focus on COVID recovery and resilience measures. Um, we are picking up the discussion. We've already started um, our, um, our working groups under the uh, presidency um, in the ECOFIN framework. So in that sense, we are uh, moving ahead on all pillars, namely deeper integration, um, mobility um, of capital and liquidity, uh, risk reduction, um, integration um, in terms of thinking about how deposit insurance can um, support the framework um, and, uh, and uh, can, as I said, continued risk reduction, both in terms of um, reducing the bank sovereign nexus and, um, and continuing to work on reducing uh, non-performing loans. So those are very important projects and we're looking to move ahead as the Eurogroup president um, from Ireland has um, has uh, said, and um, he's also working um, on um, under his Eurogroup presidency on getting the ESM reform moving, including the implementation of the um, backstop to the single resolution fund. That would obviously also be a project that would massively help the banking union. And uh, we are working very closely between the Eurogroup and ECOFIN presidencies to move that ahead. Um, <clears throat> And then um, a very important point for us um, as the third pillar is the digital union. We have four big legislative acts um, coming up from the commission, ranging from um, stable coins and cryptocurrencies to uh, service provision in the digital finance space, um, to the question of how uh, payment, um, innovative payment providers are treated. Um, we think um, all of these elements to make um, Europe and the EU um, a single market for digital finance, for fintechs, is also something that is hugely important in, in, um, in promoting the innovative power, which is, also, um, which is always a question of getting scale quickly. Um, and I think the Europe simply can't afford to be a fragmented market of 27 individual um, member states for a digital uh, finance business model, whereas competitors um, that are starting up in the US or China or other regions um, immediately have access to a much, much bigger, much more uniform um, consumer market. So in essence, I think um, Europe has a lot of homework to do if we want to compete in the digital space. Um, we're quite innovative in a lot of areas. Uh, for example, Europe has an excellent instant payment system through the European Central Bank. Um, which is why we also support the ECB's initiative on the European Payments Initiative, and we'll also work with them to see which kind of legislative support that needs. 
Um, in that sense, uh, we've already been in discussions with the Commission on that. So um, I think um, you know that's my attempt at a whirlwind tour of uh, um, the presidency in uh, 15 minutes. And I hope um, I've got given a reasonable overview, but happy to go into much more detail on the individual topics upon request. Thank you. And it certainly was a whirlwind. In fact, it was such a whirlwind that I missed out one of the points. Now, on the digital package you mentioned, in the digital union issue, you mentioned four aspects related to cryptocurrencies, digital finance payments providers, and the final one. Um, well, I, I mean, um, the, um, the, um, the, the, um, the topics are quite broad, and, uh, and uh, we, have, we have a few legislative proposals coming up gradually, so it's not clear yet whether all four of them will, will actually make it during our presidency. But uh, to go into more detail, the, the first one will be the, the legislative proposal on, um, on cross-sectional um, <clears throat> cross financial services um, and uh, operational and cyber resilience. Um, so that will deal a lot with these operational um, questions, um, with uh, registration um, um, requirements, uh, um, penetration testing requirements for cloud service providers, um, and everything that has to do with cyber resiliency, especially with more of the operational aspects of setting up, um, you know, like a European cloud provider, what are the access um, rules, the second um, rule set will be on uh, crypto assets and stable coins. I think that one is pretty clear, sort of the, what's the European answer to Libra. The third big as in, pillar will be the digital finance strategy, which will be a, um, a further evolution um, of the FinTech action plan, which was, uh, was published in, uh, in March 2018. Um, and the last uh, fourth pillar is the retail payments strategy, which will deal more with these uh, innovative payments providers and all of them um, we are um, expecting legislative or um, or um, thematic proposals by the Commission within our presidency and we'll work hard on um, advancing that then to uh, to to through the uh, member states okay maybe on the digital I could start off with one that's a little controversial I suppose the Irish position and German position will be different um, on digital taxation the taxing of, of, of large uh, online organizations, companies. Um, the State of the Union address this morning, the President of the Commission mentioned that the global agreement was not reached by the end of the year, perhaps the end of next year, that he believes Europe should move ahead on that. Given the differences of views amongst the member states, how do you see that issue on digital taxation progressing? Well, I think, um, I mean, the, the discussion in ECOFIN on Saturday um, I would say definitely definitely showed a very strong shared view that a we will try together to get a global agreement within the framework of the OECD negotiations um, on minimum taxation on on um, digital taxation and, and all of these items um, but um, there was also broad agreement that if that fails then um, we don't have a choice but to think about European rules so in that sense I do hope um, that we can uh, um, come to terms and find an agreement there. Of course, it'll be a difficult discussion, no question, but um, I, I am optimistic that what we agreed on, and um, namely, first, let's make an attempt at the global level. If that fails, we'll do something at the European level. Um, could be a um, consensus item then, um, then, depending on how the global discussion goes uh, with, towards the end of the year. Thank you. Um, so you're welcome to, as I said, to the audience, please uh, put in your questions via the Q&A function uh, there. Just going back to going in reverse order through some of your remarks, looking at the banking union piece, six months into the COVID crash, how, what your, would your evaluation of the strength of the European banking system, uh, how would you evaluate it? Well, I mean, so far um, we've had a we've had a, a very good resilience um, of the banking system. Um, we think that the the um, reaction to the last financial crisis uh, has um, shown to be quite good because the buildup um, of of capital and the resilience of capital, the constant stress testing of balance sheets, um, has led to to uh, a much more resilient banking system. And uh, I think the the, one of the main reasons why we are in a much, much better shape um, than we could be is um, that um, across the Eurozone, 
what usually happens in a um, recession as deep as the one we're witnessing right now is a massive credit crunch, right? I mean, there's a classic, uh, um, um, the classic uh, causality chain of um, RWAs increasing because of liquidity lines being drawn, um, um, defaults increasing, leading to um, to reduction in capital, um, downgrades, rating migration, adversely leading to um, increased capital requirements. And that then in the second round leading to restriction on um, on new lending. Um, all of that has um, that causality chain, at least in the in the last consequence, has not happened, right? I mean, credit across the eurozone is actually expanding. Um, and that of course has a lot to do with the European response. That in uh, the vast majority of member states, um, um, guarantee schemes uh, were launched to assure the continued flow of credit to the real economy. And um, so that's. So both the increase in capital, <clears throat> the response of European supervisors by, um, by an, in single um, in individual cases, relieving some of the capital buffers that we built, um, for example, counter-cyclical buffers, um, also gave um, some flexibility. And then, um, last but not least, the policy response also gave confidence to banks to continue lending. So I think that's, uh, that, that has really worked quite well and has made us resilient. Um, of course, we're not home free, right? I mean, uh, quite a lot of the measures um, that were taken in the member states have delayed the moment of truth in terms of uh, corporate insolvencies. Um, so in that sense, uh, we will only know, um, let's say this time next year, um, whether we've really withstood the, the test. Uh, so I think it's, it's definitely too early to give any sort of uh, um, all safe, uh, all clear um, signals. A general observation from here, and I, I wonder if, if it's similar in Germany. Many people in the uh, business of insolvencies have been surprised how slowly things have moved. Clearly, there are many businesses at any time. Uh, there are businesses that go out of business. It's just the normal process of a market economy. Uh, but there seems to have been not the upsurge in insolvencies that one might have ex would have expected with such a, a big economic contraction. Are we, to some extent, in an artificial phase at the moment where we're looking at a wave of corporate insolvencies and more NPLs as the real effects of the, the, the loss of wealth generation that happened uh, take effect? Well, I mean, first of all, I think it was a very rational response by government to respond because... Um, <clears throat> Um, in a way, the, the the nature of this crisis is so brutal, both on the demand and the supply side, individual, especially in the in the um, sectors most involved, um, that uh, that there was a new and novel policy response was required, and the suspension of insolvency regimes in some member states. I mean, Germany did that very very quickly and very early on was simply a requirement because otherwise a insolvency regime um, that is built for a normal um, <coughs> sort of uh, um, a normal um, recession that we all know how it works and that doesn't lead to this uh, to this immediate stop of demand for some sectors um, simply wouldn't have worked. So in that sense, I think it would have been as artificial to leave the, um, the, the, the standard um, rules and regulations as uh, is now it's, it's somewhat artificial, of course, to have the continuation of the insolvency regime suspensions. And what we're doing is gradual reintroduction. And I think that's absolutely the right way of doing it, um, that we gradually reintroduce the, um, the, the normal rules, but uh, um, we tend to err on the side of caution to be um, slower with reintroducing the rules because as we've seen, second waves um, do happen. Um, leading again to demand contraction, supply contractions, and restrictions. So I think it's very um, economical to also leave these rules um, operational for a bit longer. And could could I just pick up on that state on the state aids issue, the suspension of state aids, be it for the financial sector or, or more widely? I know that's outside your immediate brief, but do do you see the experience we've had in the COVID pandemic of the suspension of state aids? Uh, changing uh, European attitudes towards competition. I think it's been noted that, for example, Germany has shifted closer to the French position on creating European champions and ensuring that European competition policy does not hinder the creation of 
uh, European companies that are big enough to, to challenge American and Chinese companies, as you mentioned in your talk. Uh, so in short, is, is the state aids framework going to be permanently changed by what we've experienced? No, I think we have to differentiate. I mean, there's on the one side a very legitimate industrial policy debate, um, which has been ongoing um, before the COVID crisis and which addresses exactly these questions of um, what does the European response have to be in terms of industrial policy to make sure that we are competitive, that we make sure that we leverage the strength of the European market um, and that, uh, and that we, we remain a strong um, global <clears throat> economy as, uh, as Europe. So I think that's a very legitimate and, uh, and um, a discussion that um, continues, but uh, that has been ongoing much longer than the, the current crisis. The other aspect, which I think is um, is as legitimate, um, is the question of adaption of the of the um, com competition rules and the state aid rules to the current environment. And I think uh, we've all um, been very grateful to the European Commission, um, a for responding massively, massively quickly and efficiently, efficiently to um, come up with the temporary framework. Um, and um, um, we've had endless and hour-long discussions um, with the Commission on that that have been extremely constructive. Um, I mean, we got uh, our first approvals for, uh, for help for affected corporates, um, and, you know, in March. And so the Commission made sure that money can flow extremely quickly. Um, they've worked 24-7 since, uh, since March, essentially. Um, um, you don't want to know um, in, to which times of night and, uh, you know, over Easter, for example, we negotiated three, um, three files in parallel with the Commission and got all of them through on time to, uh, for, the, for the money to flow on a huge number of, uh, of areas from credit insurance to individual corporates to sector um, rules. So in that sense, um, you know, I only have good things to say about the work of the Commission on this topic. They've been extremely efficient and pragmatic. Okay. Just a, and a further follow-up, if I may, on that. The, there have been concerns in smaller member states and, and member states that don't have as much fiscal capacity as perhaps Germany does, that the capacity to help firms and subsidize firms through the, the worst of this crisis uh, will lead to um, an unlevel playing field across the single market and that those peripheral uh, countries that, uh, as I say, don't have that fiscal wherewithal uh, will, even, will be further hindered. Um, is, do you see that's a risk for the single market? No, um, that's precisely, you know, as you know, everything happens during, uh, you know, like the, the wee hours of the, of the night uh, in, in Europe. Um, and we literally spent three days on the 7th, 8th and 9th of April um, negotiating a package that uh, ended up being a 540 billion package, of which 200 billion goes to the European Investment Bank um, for a guarantee program to provide state guarantees or EIB triple A guarantees to SME lending, um, SME investing, um, in part larger corporate investing across the European Union, in particular benefiting um, or intended to benefit those member states that don't have large. Um, 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 promotional bank systems or the, the fiscal capacity. So I think um, we address that head on because, I mean, I think the, the concern that you have is spot on, absolutely. Um, the worst thing that can happen is an asymmetric response. Um, we saw that after the financial crisis, um, but uh, I do think we've avoided that because already in April, um, we, we negotiated a big, big package, um, and, um, and the, the EIB is now fully operational for these programs. So in that sense, we've really, we've really done what we can. And of course, the, um, the, um, the um, fiscal response, which was at the national level, very uniform, but now at the European level, also very uniform and big, um, also gives credit um, and confidence to markets that, uh, that there will be a much more symmetric response. And of course, the ECB's action has uh, stabilized that and has helped that along um, also very well. On loan guarantees, Germany has been very strong on, on loan guarantees for, for, for uh, companies. 
Um, do you have concerns about that? We in Ireland have bad experience on, on loan guarantees uh, during the financial crisis in 2008. Significant guarantees were given to financial institutions and uh, many people uh, feel that was, a, that was a bad mistake. Um, do you have concerns about, about loan guarantees for, for private businesses? I mean, of course, in the construction of our program, we paid a huge amount of attention to potential um, issues that uh, we learned uh, were done um, poorly during the financial crisis. And um, as in Ireland, also in Germany, the taxpayers paid a huge, huge bill uh, for the um, bailing out of, uh, of the banking system. Um, we deliberately constructed our loan program to be completely different. Um, and I think the, the, the first huge difference, of course, is the, the um, financial crisis um, programs went mainly to a very small, concentrated number of banks. Um, our lending program in Germany, for example, goes to 82,000 corporates. So that's the number of corporates that we've addressed so far. So, um, yes, of course, we have risk. And if, uh, you know, like the, the current recession lasts for years and years, then, of course, this credit risk that the government is taking by uh, lending to 82,000 corporates will materialize and will lose money. But on the other side, we structured the transactions in a way that if uh, we go back to normal um, in a reasonable time frame, um, <clears throat> the state can actually recover those um, those credit losses that it will inevitably suffer because some of the 82,000 will go um, into insolvency, of course, just statistically, um, um, through the interest uh, um, participation um, from those who are able to repay. So uh, we have paid a huge amount of attention to learning from what went wrong, um, and I do hope that uh, that the um, that the bill that the taxpayer pays will be much much smaller <clears throat> um, than. Um, uh, much much smaller than uh, was uh, was in the financial crisis. Um, uh, it won't be zero. I'm not naive. I think uh, the reason why the government went in is because there wasn't a private market lending at market terms. Um, so in that sense, I think um, you know it's very normal that uh, that this won't be a uh, that this is not this is not a for profit operation. But the economic benefit of these programs, I think, is much much larger than the fiscal cost will end up being. Okay, good. Um, a final one of the banking union, deposit insurance, common deposit insurance for the Eurozone. Where are we on that? I think it's, it's part of the package, right? And I think, uh, I think uh, in isolation, um, deposit insurance leads to nothing. Um, if we only did in deposit insurance and nothing else, then we wouldn't be a much better banking union than we already have, um, because we also need integration steps um, in particular um, if we remain as fragmented and segmented um, in terms of capital and liquidity um, um, between um, member states, um, then uh, then uh, just introducing a deposit insurance will have absolutely no or m absolutely minuscule effect relative to the um, relative to the efforts uh, required. So in that sense, I think if and only if we agree on a big package and a very ambitious package that should include steps towards deposit insurance as a safeguard for those member states who um, host big banking corporates. I think uh, that's a very plausible request, absolutely understood. Um, <clears throat> and that's the position of the German finance ministry, by the way, not yet common um, agreement within the German government. I have to say that as a disclaimer. Um, but, uh, but, uh, but we do think um, in the finance ministry and have written a paper in November 19 that uh, deposit insurance can be a useful component um, if the other aspects, namely risk reduction and further integration steps um, on the capital and liquidity movement um, are also taken, then um, it can be a very plausible step in the right direction. Okay, good. Let's shift over to capital markets union. Uh, you mentioned that Europe has an opportunity to become a, a, a world leader in green sustainable investment. Uh, my colleague, Luca Callahan-White, notes today that Germany will issue or has issued a 12 billion sovereign green bond. Um, but he asks this question. Many analysts have commented that one of the most significant challenges facing the green bond market is that of greenwashing or conveying a false impression about environmental credentials. Are there ways to prevent that? Um, is that a concern that you and, and your ministry have? 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's the prime concern for for the green bond market because um, it's a young and uh, and fastly um, growing market. So in that sense, as always, um, with things like that, if uh, investors have the impression that um, what's written on the bonds is not what's inside the bonds, and that uh, that there is um, sort of a a, um, a lack of transparency, then uh, the market uh, will lose credibility. So in that sense, uh, when we did our um, green bond issuance, we paid very, very careful attention that uh, all aspects of the ICMA uh, green bond standards um, are fulfilled. And that has been... That. Um, so we, uh, we um, were very careful to implement all aspects of the ICMA green bond standards. And I think that's very important. Of course, one of the big debates in the sovereign green bond market is always the big question of what green um, expenditures are you financing? And um, due to the fact that parliaments control current and future expenditures, um, I don't think anyone can come up with a smarter idea than the idea to benchmark the, when you're doing a 2020 green bond, um, the volume that you're refinancing to the 29 actual expenditures, because A, in terms of, um, you know, if you're issuing a green bond in February 2020, um, you don't have a clear number yet on how much you're actually going to spend on green. Um, and uh, you obviously have no idea what the parliament is going to approve you in green expenditures for 21. So in that sense, the, the fact that ICMA agreed um, that the 20, that sort of the, the back one year backward looking, ICMA even allows a bit longer, but, uh, but uh, we took as our benchmark one year backward looking, um, that is a very reasonable um, idea. Um, it allows you to be very clear in what you're financing um, and, um, and allows full transparency. And given the directionality of travel of green expenditures at the moment with clear expansion, um, you know, the fact that we, uh, we had um, 12 billion of eligible um, expenditures for 11 billion of um, expected um, issuance also shows you that, uh, you know, that the investors can have confidence that uh, we're actually spending the money on green um, that, we're, that we're raising in the green bond markets. Right. Interesting. Very interesting. Um, you, AML, anti-money laundering, was something you mentioned quite a bit in the discussion of, of CNU. Um, your preference for the ministry is, you, you mentioned, to move towards e-regulation rather than directive because of uh, uneven application. Um, how, has that become more serious, that issue around uneven application, different di direct divergence of the effect of directives? across the member states? I don't think it's become particularly more, um, more um, um, concerning than, than it always has, right? But we've just seen another, um, another um, series of, um, of, um, of um, um, sort of <clears throat> weakest link debates, right? I mean, I'll give you a good example. Um, during, the, um, during the last round of AMLD implementation, member states are allowed to to um, impose um, identification requirements for buying um, for buying gold, um, and they can choose what from which amount they start requiring these um, these um, identification. Um, um, and of course, if you know, like country A, which neighbors country B in Schengen, um, requires identification starting from two thousand euros, and uh, next door neighbor um, um, country B. Um, only requires identification from 10,000, then guess what the uh, money launderer is going to do, right? So it makes no sense um, on a rule like that in a Schengen room where everyone can move from between countries with no controls um, to have different caps or different, uh, different uh, amounts uh, starting from which you have to identify yourself when you're buying physical gold. Um, simply makes no sense, right? Because you're you're inviting arbitrage if you have it differently, right? And it's a it's 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 the weakest link. So in that sense, it's and there's you know dozens of these examples. Um, I'm just picking that one because it's so illustrative of the um, problem of the directive versus regulation debate. Okay, good, good. That's very clear. Um, let's move from the micro to the macro. Um, Mark Dempsey, who's a former EU policy advisor at the British financial regulator asks, uh, can you speak a little about governance of member state spending of the recovery funds? And he notes in particular an article in the Italian media that noted 
some of the money was being allocated to the purchase of fighter jets. Is there, you know, is there a concern that the recovery fund may go to more, let's say, spending items that might be controversial in other member states? I know this was a particular concern of the Dutch and three other countries around the time of the discussion. Um, do you have thoughts on, on, uh, on that question? Yeah, no, I mean, the, the governance is very, very clear on that, right? I mean, the, and the process is, <coughs> is very clear at the summit conclusions level and is being now implemented into actual um, detailed legislation. And, um, and um, the, the rules are very clear. I mean, the, the, um, the recovery um, and resilience fund um, um, expenditures have to meet uh, criteria that um, will be governed by the you know, commission reviewing them, the European Finance Committee reviewing them, a com so-called comitology process um, of the member states reviewing them. There's even an emergency break that will allow a single country to ask for a review at the head of state level. Um, so there are so many emergency breaks and, uh, and, um, and um, mechanisms involved that will assure that the goal of, um, that of spending these according to, um, according to um, national plans uh, that uh, meet the European semester country specific recommendation framework um, that um, that uh, that uh, we are very optimistic that uh, that this money will be spent um, in growth enhancing ways I mean, there will always be individual cases of someone finding some program um, you know like but uh, but uh, I think for the for really the bulk of the of the expenditure it's going to go exactly where it needs to go namely growth enhancing measures uh, my colleague Andrew Gilmore asks, um, how should we interpret the recent softening of the German stance on debt mutualization? Is it simply a one-off and crisis driven or is it indicative of a broader shift in German EU policy? In other words, is transfer union on the agenda? Well, first of all, this is not transfer union, right? I think that's the, um, that, that it's very clear we are not talking about joint and several debt um, in the 750 billion program, and I think that's uh, that is very important. It's common debt, uh, but it's peri passu debt, right? And that is a huge, huge, and politically very, very important difference that uh, that was also agreed on in um, in unanimity. So I think that uh, that um, clearly shows you that this is not a com complete reversal of the German position. Um, and so in that sense, I think that's uh, that's also a very a very good um, good um, path towards achieving consensus in German Parliament and making sure that this passes, um, and in other parliaments, of course, as well. So I think there is no no shift in view here. Um, what concerns the question of of um, the the program in and of itself um, and the novelty of it? Of course, it's novel. Yes, but it's novel for a good reason, right? I mean, we've never faced such a deep. Um, um, recession in Europe, um, even after the financial crisis, we didn't. Um, and um, also, I think we have to learn lessons from the response to the financial crisis. The response to the financial crisis was um, massive fiscal expansion in those countries that had fiscal space and fiscal contraction, um, in part even austerity programs in those that didn't which led to asymmetry number one. Asymmetry number two was then guided by the fact that the severity of the credit uh, cycle was worse in some countries than others. And again, in a very unfavorable asymmetric uh, way. And C, the European Union didn't have a very substantial common fiscal response either and left all the hard work to the ECB, um, uh, which led to a huge number of problems that go back to the core root of the issue in Europe that we have a monetary union, but not a fiscal union. So in that sense, um, if you think about the, the, the analysis of mistakes that we made after the financial crisis, I think it's only plausible that uh, we agreed to a very strong um, and, um, and as symmetric as we can get uh, fiscal response for the EU after this crisis. Um, uh, with regards, in your, your, your type, the title of your presentation is Timely, Targeted, Temporary and Transformational. On the timely and transformational, you, you mentioned that the, the funds would begin to flow at the beginning of next year and over a period of time. Is, is, that, um, is that fast enough, first question? And secondly, 
Will it be transformational? And I, I'd note that the European Central Bank has already purchased more than 750 billion uh, in asset purchases under its pandemic program. Um, so in that context, is the recovery fund big enough to be transformational? Well, I mean, 750 billion is a lot of money. So uh, I would say <laughs> I would say it's definitely big enough. Um, no, but uh, but seriously, I, I do think the the if you compare it to the size of GDP at, across the EU, of course, it is a very very substantial amount. Um, and if you're um, also adding it to all of the fiscal measures that have been taken at national level, um, I think it shows you very clearly that the overall fiscal response of the European Union is quite massive. Um, does the money flow quickly enough? It never does um, in, after a recession. Um, but um, I do think the fact that the member states saw very early on in the process, namely beginning of April, that there will be a common European response. They also were able in their national responses to the, to the crisis to act much more decisively because they knew that in the worst case, Europe would be there for them. And the fact that then in July, we had another um, commitment to a strong response um, with the ability to post finance some of the um, some of the fiscal measures taken now also means that even if no, the money doesn't flow explicitly um, next year, implicitly in terms of relieving financing conditions, um, you can see that it already has a, a front-loading effect. And if you see how European sovereign sped, spreads have evolved, um, you know, a from the ECB response in um, on the 18th of March until the um, 21st of July with a big contraction and then further contraction since the agreement on a fiscal package um, in, um, in, um, in, in July, you can really see that this effect of front loading um, and confidence from markets to sovereigns, which allow the sovereigns, um, even though no European money flows yet, to effectively already utilize some of the benefits from the agreement shows that that it's definitely had a huge um, 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 effect of relief for the European Union. Mm. Just following up on that, in terms of the, the, the use of the European Central Bank's balance sheet, there's clearly been a, a massive and, and, and a sudden expansion of the balance sheet. And that has been, as you say, very important for calming sovereign bond markets and credit markets uh, as well. Are there risks with this strategy? And how concerned are you in Germany with the use of uh, of asset purchases on such a scale by the central bank? I will not answer that question okay. because uh, it is a very long and firm tradition of German government policy not to comment on the completely independent monetary policy um, um, of the European Central Bank. <laughs> that is absolutely fine, fully understood. Um, we have one, I'm just going to finish on a general question about how you see the recovery evolving, but we've one quite detailed one on cryptocurrencies, an, an area that I know nothing about, to be very honest with you. But the question is, um, do you have any thoughts on the European Commission's draft proposal on the regulating of crypto assets and its possible implications for European monetary policy? Now, that is a tough question. Yeah, and unfortunately, I can't answer it, uh, not because I, I can't... Uh, um, answer it in terms of content, but because the proposal um, for some unknown reason leaked um, and is not official, um, um, I could tell you something if it were official, but given that it's not official, um, I do want to um, um, at this stage not make any comments, but um, as the Commission has announced, it will make, uh, make public pronouncements on this topic uh, soon. Um, so in that sense, uh, that'll be the, the point in time then to start a discussion. However, um, it is a very good and established tradition in the European Union that the country that has the presidency um, um, stays quite neutral on these things um, during, during its presidency. Again, fully understood. Um, so let's conclude on, on the... But one thing, I mean, maybe um, as a very, uh, I think, and, and it is important because we, we have made some pronouncements. Um, I mean, and one of the things that we have to take into account and that we will take into account is the issue of European sovereignty. Um, we can't allow um, um, stablecoin or crypto providers um, to, um, to um, enter into European consumer markets in a non-regulated way from third countries without respecting um, the, the, um, the um, um, denomination in euro, without granting secure access to collateral if this 
if a, if a product is marketed as a stable coin, it needs to have a stable coin inside, including full recourse by consumers to collateral and things like that. Okay, thank you for that. And uh, just in the final minutes, maybe just get your perspective on the shape of the recovery in Germany as you see it from, uh, from Berlin and indeed for the wider European economy. Clearly, there has been an asymmetric effect of the pandemic economically, as well as from a health perspective, uh, across the, the EU. Um, so any thoughts you might have on how you feel the recovery is moving in Germany when, uh, for example, output might return to pre-pandemic levels and any thoughts on the asymmetric nature of the economic shock? Yeah, yeah I mean, okay, let's go from the V, um, from the top of the V to the, um, to the bottom. Um, and that, um, has been painful, of course, but the good news is it's been much, much less painful than we feared in March. It's been less painful than we feared in April. Um, so in the, that sense, we've been constantly revising the, um, the um, <clears throat> predictions that we had um, sort of close to double digit negative um, at the beginning. Currently, we're at, uh, at a sort of a um, government projection of minus 5.8 for the year. So in that sense, we've seen much more, um, much less adverse impact on the downslope of the V. Um, the counterfactual to that is that also on the upslope of the V, it's not been a pretty V at all. I mean, my six-year-old is learning to write at the moment, and it looks a little bit like a sort of scribbled V, which is uh, somewhere, you know, like the, 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 the upslope is definitely not as steep as the downslope. Um, and I think that, uh, co that, that corresponds to the, um, to the, the experience in many member states that very likely the increase in GDP in 21 um, will be will not fully compensate the downturn in 20. Um, for Germany, we're expecting to be back to pre-crisis level in Q1 22. So we're expecting um, after minus 5.8 this year, plus 4.4 ish next next year, and then to um, sort of. Uh, um, in the um, first or maybe second quarter of next year then to be to be flat again. So in that sense, um, for the Eurozone, I think that takes a bit longer, but you know, somewhere ballpark 22, we will have recovered. So it'll roughly take, let's call it 18 months to recover the loss from the, from the current 12 month period. So in that sense, yes, it is asymmetric, but on the other side, it's not horrible asymmetric. So that uh, we think with the fiscal response, we may actually see an improvement to that if we achieve the the 750 billion funds flowing quicker, maybe we recover quicker. And on that optimistic note, we've come to the end of our hour long slot. Uh, State Secretary, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I think, as you said, it really was a, a whirlwind. You covered an enormous amount of ground very clearly, uh, very good information. And I'm sure our members got, uh, took, uh, took, took much from your talk today. So thank you for joining us. and. Uh, we uh, look forward perhaps to welcoming you in person uh, in maybe 19, in 2022 when we've all fully recovered. Many thanks. Good afternoon. Thank you.